Welcome back to The Shed, everybody. We're really happy you're here. We have a very special guest arriving very shortly. Mumalak Kakak, the NDP member for Nunavut, is going to join us here in The Shed. We're going to have a nice conversation with her about what's going on. What are issues that she's dealing with up there? What are stuff that we've heard and not heard? What are things that we might want to think about? So here she comes. Stick with us. This should be interesting. So PJ, you've been interested in Northern Affairs, I've noticed, for, for quite some quite some time. I was going to say six months, but you're saying more like 18. I think, so yeah. What what kind of got you there? And further to that, what what made you decide to invite Mumalak Kakak here to to discuss what's been going on up there? During the last federal election campaign, when Jagmeet Singh was asked in Montreal, where were the trillions of dollars for providing fresh water to all the reserves in Canada? Where was that going to come from? And his response was, if we were talking about Montreal's water supply, would you even be asking me where the money's going to come from? That really got my attention. I just thought, whoa, okay, so this is a guy I want to hear from. And and so then after that, I Tanya Tagak is a throat singer that I'd heard of. She won in Juno or something at some point. She was in the spotlight and I had heard of her. So I started uh, following her on Twitter and then somebody else made some witty remark that made me laugh. And I started following them and they posted some music they'd done and followed that. And it kind of just went from there. I got myself listening to this conversation. I don't participate in it much because I kind of don't feel I'm supposed to. But then what happened was at some point, Mumalak posted this thing where she just said, does anybody out there do podcasts? Because I'd go on one. <laughs> and so I just thought, okay, she doesn't mean us. <laughs> <laughs> she means, are any Indigenous people in Nunavut who need to be heard going to be helped by having me on? Because I'm up for that. But I just thought, uh, let's try it. And just sent a note and made a pitch saying that guys like us are exactly who needs to hear what she has to say. And she, so they signed up. So then I thought, well, I bet none of my our peers really know a whole lot about most of this stuff either. So why don't and we just put it out? I'm really glad you invited her on and and with that, let's hear from Mumalak. So you have by far the most professional looking background. You're getting an unwanted <laughs> glimpse into our actual lives here. That's <laughs> Hi, Mumalak. A, I'm Kevin. Oh, yeah, that's Kevin. I'm, I'm Pat, PJ. And I'm Richard. Welcome to the shed. And we are really looking for, really, really pleased you made the time. I'm not exactly sure why you made the time for us with our audience and but super pleased to have you here. We're all excited. I'm all excited anyway. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And that's exactly, we need to create more conversations that look like this because I'm sitting on here with three older white guys and we need to have space where we can have these conversations together uh, regardless of the backgrounds we come from. So I think that time and conversation and words are are really important. So anybody that's willing to give me an ear is worth giving the time to, oh, you know, give that information. Good, good. Cause that's, that is a hundred where I was coming from. I saw your post and I thought based on uh, my level of ignorance and based on what I was taught and not taught in school and what I have subsequently sort of found out a little bit about my thought was, we're probably just the kind of guys that need to hear more from you. Uh, and our audience is probably just, no offense to our audience, my suspicion is they got the same kind of education as I got and have the same gaps in their knowledge largely that I do. So you've been bioed pretty much endlessly, like who you are, when you got elected, how you got nominated, and, and that's all great. And we'll put links to your um, wiki stuff into our website but as a sort of an easy way to get going, we kind of just wanted to ask about growing up in Baker Lake. We all grew up in southern BC, in the interior, small town, you know, skiing, hockey. They had winter, but they had summer. And I don't know at all whether there's any comparison. Like, what did you and your friends do? What do kids do in Baker Lake? So I think just some key uh, different uh, 
things that would be normal for me and not necessarily normal to you growing up is just as an example, even the landscape. There aren't any trees because we have permafrost. So for me, it's normal or I view it as normal to see for thousands of kilometers sometimes. So being down south can feel uh, can feel claustrophobic and enclosing because we don't have the trees in the big buildings and that's just the normal that we grew up with. Um, mm. Same with accessing education, you know, attending, being able to attend post-secondary. There's very, very few and very limited programmings for that. When I had graduated in 2011, I wanted to go into the human resource field, and there's no way I could get education for that in the territory. There's a few things that you can kind of, that are regular programs, if you will, uh, like the Nunavut teacher education program. There's a nurse, nursing program. There's a few other ones like that. But for the most part, if you want to do something a bit more specialized, you have to leave the territory. Hmm. Uh, accessing basic health uh, health services, most for the most part, most communities, when women are going to have a child, they leave four weeks before their due date just as a precaution Oof. because they don't have access to uh, those necessary pieces of equipment and those resources in case there is a complication yeah. with the baby. So just things like that. For us, it's it's so normal uh, growing up. Uh, if you have a friend that is expecting a child, they are going to go a month before they're due. That's just how it goes. Uh, if you want to access post-secondary education, you often have to leave. That's just the normal. We wake up every day to know trees. That's just my what was my normal and what was I, it was raised as my normal. Yeah. Uh, some things like that you wouldn't necessarily think of uh, in the South and being isolated. That means fly in, fly out for our essentials. Our airline is our essential service. Um, so when you have a five-day blizzard, that is very real that you might not have access to groceries and other items for a number of days in a community. That just means it was so normal and it is so normal for us to learn how to ration things, to learn how to plan for a couple yeah. day blizzard, to learn how to you know make sure you have water for that full time. So those kinds of things, it was just normal for us to learn growing up that you wouldn't necessarily think of down south. So no. I think those are some very big key ones. And then in that, there are just so many things that tie into it where what you perceive as normal and I perceived as normal growing up could be very different. I think the biggest key difference is that when we come down south, we are expected to accommodate to the southern way of living. When we have visitors come to the north, it's almost like, it's not expected that you adopt to our normals and our lifestyle. So I find that that's one of the biggest differences is as Northerners, we're often expected to be able to adapt. And on the flip side, you know, how are we being to work with to adapt to us and what we need? So I think what, that's the biggest difference. What's an example of that kind of adaptation that's expected? I'm not, I'm not really clear. Like, so you come down here and you're expect, what's a thing that you, would be expected to do that is strange, weird? I um, I think of things like our small town normals. It It's so much, in my mind, easier to access in some ways certain healthcare items in the north because the way it works is often you, you know exactly who you're calling or who you're talking to. Mm. You know who the head nurse is. You say, hey, I want to talk to so-and-so. And you say, um, this is the appointment I'm looking for. Whereas down south, there's the whole, like uh -huh. I didn't have a pharmacy in my hometown growing up until recently, where now you have to go there and get your medication. Where at, whereas, you know, before it was just your one-stop shop at the health center, yeah, not yeah. having to do that extra step of going and learning how to navigate right. the pharmacy system, for example. Yeah, that's a pretty um, good example too, actually, yeah accessing education uh for example we don't have i think there's one stoplight technically in nunavut but even just having to access post-secondary somewhere else and we don't have these bus systems that's not normal we don't have like ottawa transit for example we don't have those kinds of things in the territory so now not only are you forcing people to have to leave their homelands to access education but now they have to learn this new 
this whole transportation thing. system that they weren't raised in, they're not aware of. So that's what I mean in ways yeah. of having to accommodate on the flip side. Yeah. What would be an example of someone coming from down in the south here, up there, and not really accommodating to the culture? That's sometimes where things can get complex, and that's where we start seeing these all these different layers of historical aspects to the evolution of how we came into this situation and all these macro and micro uh, aggressions that happen. So on a huge level, what we see in Nunavut is a lack of opportunity for economic development for local individuals. When I did the housing tour, it was very apparent that there and very clear that there weren't many initiatives in the north for those local individuals in construction, for example. Uh, All the guys I saw weren't Inuk, they weren't from there, they clearly weren't local. And we see that in a huge number of positions, uh, mostly related to construction, uh, teachers and healthcare professionals. Those in in those fields, most often we see a lot more non-Inuit than Inuit and especially in power making places. Mm. So, There are already systems and policies that make it difficult for an Inuk in particular and and Northerners, but more so Inuit, that make it more difficult to be able to have voices and and things heard as opposed to um, somebody. Again, usually what is happening when uh, people are coming from the South is they have an understanding of these systems that I talk about that we are forced to be accommodated to. So often an individual, for example, has more of an awareness of, say, how to bring a complaint to the healthcare system and actually get it escalated to the public, maybe get some media attention and therefore actually get things done. Whereas somebody that might be from there often is not educated and made aware of Mm -hmm. what their rights are. And that was the one of the biggest things that I found as well, that people just weren't even sure of, you know, who who can they talk to when they were having a problem with their child who had been sick for X amount of days on end, and they had just kept going to the health center and being brought home with Tylenol. We see those kinds of stories in the North all the time, and they're happening constantly every day. Uh, What we don't see is media covering it effectively. Mm. So, For me, I find it hard to give you specific examples because there are just already so many things that are working against Nunavut and people from from the north in most situations. Yeah, it sounds like it. I mean, it would be one thing to come to an essentially a foreign place like the south and be faced with a whole bunch of adaptation. But to have to deal with it the other way in your own home. So we're, we're all from a small town, square mile. Same sort of thing. You know, everybody, you could send a letter when we were young, you could send a letter to post office box. Morris will know Morris was the postmaster. And he just knew if you had the name on there, he'd put it in the box. Same sort of thing. You knew who the pharmacist was, but we didn't have anybody coming from out of town acting as though we needed to be told what to do, what to think, how to act. We never had the feeling that somebody from out of town was required for us to get anything done or somebody uh, from out of town had a say over whether we did or didn't do anything in that community and still don't. Sounds like there is some of that up there where incoming people in various positions feel that they have an authority that maybe they don't actually have. And residents sometimes are not sure whether they do or don't have that authority. That would be rough. But that's also, you know, I've been talking about a lot about, I phrase it as the beauty of colonization and the beauty of colonization is you don't know you're in it when it's working at its best. And that's often what we see in Mm. the territory. And that's exactly what happened in my life. I went through high school. I went through, uh, attended various post-secondary institutions and really realized just how quite frankly, messed up Canadian history is and continues to be and continues to evolve really messy and really dark and in a way that isn't fully explained. What has been able to happen over the years is, and this is my question as well, in colonization when Inuit were forced to 
move from our nomadic way of life into communities, facing dog slaughters, you know, the TB ec- epidemics that we continue to see in that not enough Inuit were taught the, these processes that we are forced into. And on the flip side, we therefore almost don't know how to help ourselves mm. out of them. So mm. we are forced into unsafe housing, but no one taught us how to navigate that system to get us out of it. So now whose responsibility is it? And I, and I saw this quite clearly throughout the housing tour. My dad was born out on the land. Our parents and grandparents who were removed from the land, this happened like two generations ago, a generation ago. And somehow our parents and grandparents have been able to create people like me that can see this horrible turmoil, can explain it and communicate it clearly. And still we're seeing ourselves in these situations where we've been crying out for help for the last 27 years And so whose responsibility is it now is what I'm getting at. When Inuit were forced to move from an igloo or a tent to a home and things like turning on the bathroom fan for 20 minutes after you shower, uh, every home had a, the furnace room had a hole about that big that went clearly to the ground, like you could see snow. That's on purpose to make sure that the the small little furnace room can still breathe but tons of people were covering that up and you could see the walls physically starting to shrink in but whose responsibility is it now to teach Inuit this is how you care for a home that you were forced into Mm -hmm. so I think there's some really big questions where it's yeah I, I think to an extent we can't be telling people how to live and what decisions but we also need to be very clear on some of this simply wasn't transferred knowledge and sometimes we just need to actually teach people how to do things yeah and i saw a lot of those pictures uh, from that tour and i did see um, speeches by you in parliament after that tour and i think during it i saw on instagram some of the it's pretty harrowing actually just to watch i mean it looked to me when i saw those things that here's somebody who's just hanging on I'm talking about you, and it looked like it was pretty hard to talk about. And looking at those pictures and reading some of the statistics, some of the situations, uh, yeah, that would be very difficult to deal with. One of the things that has been uh, a shock to me is gaps in the education we received. So relocation was actually underway when we were in high school, I'm pretty sure. And I don't know about either of the other two dogs here, but... I don't recall anybody telling me, oh yeah, they're moving, they're moving those guys to places so that the Russians can't take over, whatever the hell it was. I don't recall it just even being talked about. Certainly in the 70s, we just got European white history. That was yeah. it. We, we would hear about the Louis Riel rebellion, might be like one one hundredth of the curriculum. But in terms of history, there was nothing about you know what the damage was done to the native populations in Canada was just not there. Like the Jesuits and smallpox and all that stuff. We would hear nothing about that. So I I would be curious too, if you guys can remember hearing much about the cold war more specifically, not necessarily Northern, but that was why that was, it was the cold war. Americans came to Canada and said, Oh, look, they're not taking care of their Northerners. And therefore they don't occupy that land. Canada uh, America brought it to the international media stage because we know Canada doesn't do anything for Indigenous peoples, good or bad, unless they're under international pressure. And that's where we started seeing forced relocation. The Canadian government at the time said, oh, snap, we don't want to lose that area. Yeah, yeah. They just were able to craft it in a really nice way from the get-go. Yeah. Um, I think here's another thing that people, uh, before I get into education, people don't realize how much the nor the south affects the north and unrightfully so in 1983 there were a bunch of white people on parliament hill protesting against the white coat ban 1983 right it was a bunch of sorry it was a small group i'm pretty sure of white guys out newfoundland labrador that were clubbing seals and again somebody got it to international attention and here canada was saying uh, we can't be 
killing the baby seals. What wasn't understood at the time was what that relation looks like to the seal skin market for majority Inuit communities. And what had happened was that had sent the seal skin market crashing down. Of course, according to the federal government, what is good enough is the one word blurb that says Inuit are exempt from this specific mm. item. But what that did was sent the seal skin market crashing and our suicide skyrocketed and we have never seen it come down. And no one talks about it like that. No one makes those links. My whole back of my head stood up with goosebumps when my dad said, I remember the first suicide in 1984. And I remember how many we had that year. And I stopped counting after 12. And I was like, wow, that was the white coat ban a bunch of non-Indigenous white people, no clue how this is going to affect an entire group of tens of thousands of people. The federal institution lets this fly by, doesn't give us the recognition that we should be seeing. And therefore, we see this death toll just skyrocketed. And that's another one that's, who do you put that responsibility on? When we talk about Indigenous life and Inuit lives, whose responsibility is it that we have nine times the suicide rate? And to me, it's these federal and these RCMP institutions. You can't point it to our particular because they all have been failing us, all the governments, all the people in power since the beginning. It's the actual institutions themselves. Yeah. In terms of education, I, again, I don't. I think we might have had one class that none of us took seriously. Um, and and that was the thing. At the time, we were so concerned about passing our exams in Shakespeare and you know, Macbeth. And I can't even tell you specifically what those plays were about because I personally didn't enjoy them. I also went through two grueling years of World War One and Two. I can't tell you anything from that. I can't. School and the education system, I think, is a, it doesn't teach you the skills that we should be teaching individuals. And I think especially from high school, it's uh, certain- teach me how to budget, teach me yeah. how to do my taxes, teach me how to do these things that will help me in my life. Um, not MX plus B equals Y. Have I ever used that again? No. But like, and this is the thing, if you want to, if that's the kind of field you want to go into, that's cool. Then that option should be there for you. But for the most part, uh, let's teach people how to take care of their taxes and finance and things like that. Um, So to answer your question, I I think it's something that in Nunavut, anyways, it can be a bit more community and I would say even more so teacher based. Like I, I can think of some teachers that definitely incorporate their knowledge from the community, the knowledge of the history. Uh, I can think of someone I grew up with that went to go get her teacher education. Now she's back in in incorporating Arctic plants into her bio classes. Like that's so cool. And that's exactly what we should be seeing. Um, And we just don't, not often enough, but I think in general, even indigenous peoples, and that's the other scary thing that, a lot of non-Indigenous people don't realize is that I'm educated now, yes, because I chose to be and because I realized I didn't have that information and I went to go and find it. But what we see happening a lot is non-Indigenous people kind of coming up to Indigenous people and expecting that your our knowledge and what we know is this kind of unsaid access you have unlimited unsaid access like it's one thing for me as a member of parliament to come on here and have these conversations but so often we're turned to as like the one brown person in the room or the one northerner in the room and it's like what do you think speak on behalf of yeah and there are ways there are people there are systems doing it for sure but And that's the frustrating part from the federal level. Trudeau has the power to incorporate this Canadian history into our education system and refuses to do it. And that's the frustrating part. But there are definitely people that are trying to make that history known and and make it something more consistent in their classrooms. Yeah, I do see some of that in social media. Some of the people I follow on there really proudly announcing programming changes in, say, for instance, northern Manitoba. You will see announcements about uh, Indigenous language schools. I think I mentioned Cree and Ojibwe in the, in the questions. And you sort of think, 
uh, like in your case, two years of World War II will... Well, is I don't it know. even relevant to our lives? Like, it, it is I understand it they were periods of huge events that had happened in that point of time. But why don't we fixate on... Did you know that when residential schools were happening, they had French, the French came over to study our residential school systems to figure out how to incorporate that into their prisons? No, I didn't. I'm not pretty know sure that. the Germans did that too. Um, so, like these kinds of things, I think it's more how society discusses white events. Yeah, I don't disagree. I'm just saying, in terms of the education that you got and how much of it was relevant, probably the educations we got was more relevant to us because the education we got was white based. I completely agree that education. On more practical things, I've said this to my daughters again and again. I, I wish, how come you don't know how to change a tire? Why don't they teach you that in school? That's an actual skill that could save your life. So I grew up in the interior. I played hockey with guys with Russian surnames from Castlegar in BC. They had uncles and parents who were also forced into residential schools for the exact same reasons. And I just knew nothing about it. They didn't say it to me in the dressing room at hockey. And I, I found out about it decades later. So why? Why? Because it doesn't support a narrative that says Canada is a fair place. Canada is for supporting the little guy. Canada is a peacekeeping nation. Uh, yeah, it's not so much in a lot of respects. I don't know how much of it is from just a general ignorance. Um, if if you're, you know, I mean, if you're 95%, Rosslyn was 98% white, but in general, in people in power in Canada have been kind of monocultural. Yeah. And so when you're ignorant, you just do, well, what do I know about what, what's the education? But I, I think we do see a big change in that. It's just that it's slow because the education world is just as slow to change as all the other kind of society areas. And so like, I think kids in school right now get way more education on indigenous issues Perhaps not on Northern issues, I'll bet, but it, we do see a, a general change happening. Jeez, I hope so. But I would, you know, one, the one thing I would point out though, uh, I would kind of differ with is that if, if people in the States lived through Donald Trump for four years and through the kind of white nationalism that's rampant down there, I would say that education about what led up to the second world war probably is, is pretty important from that perspective. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll just say <laughs> typically our little podcast is all just light and fluffy. We have a few laughs and all that. And if I look through my list of questions, not many of these are very much fun. And this next one probably isn't either. I, I looked at pieces of eyewitness accounts from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I think you might have posted them. And they did refer to the destruction of dog teams, you know, deliberate destruction of dog teams. There was weak rationales offered about how the dogs were running wild or not being looked after. And it, it was very hard reading, but I guess what it led me to wonder is if there was one piece of, I don't know, a book or a document like that, that you could magically wave your wand and make mandatory reading, you know, to qualify for citizenship, say in this country or to vote, say just something that you think really contains a lot that most people don't know. If you could wave a wand and make people read it, what would it be? I think I would pick the Qaydani Truth Commission. So back in 2010, the Makavik Corporation is the organization that represents Nunavik or Northern Quebec Inuit. They had approached the federal government and asked, uh, they wanted an investigation into the dog slaughters. Mm -hmm. uh, as usual, the feds sent in the very people to investigate themselves. So they sent an RCMP to send an RCMP that didn't turn into anything. But what that did do is that it started a conversation between the Makavik Corporation, the Qayyitani Inuit Association, and I believe ITK. I could be wrong on that last one, so don't quote me on that one. Um, but what they did was they had compiled a report for the 13 specific Baffin communities that talks to specific history between 1950 and 1975, which was when all those dog slaughters and forced relocation, the TB epidemic, when all those things were happening. It takes testimonials from elders that uh, are still around or have recently passed. Uh, and it just takes the, I remember 
the one that really sticks out to me, it shows a graph for one of the communities and it shows the uh, amount of income that Inuit primarily made. And it was 20, just over 20,000 for that year. And that was uh, government allowances, government handouts, basically. So you are forced into this community, Mm -hmm. your dogs are slaughtered, then you're given a handout from the government and said, this is what you're going to live off of. The next amount of income was just over 8,000. So hold on. The first amount was closer to 24. So about a third under those government handouts was how Inuit was making money off of furs. We know from stories that Inuit were getting so ripped off, so ripped off. They would... um, come into the store and they would stand up a rifle and they would say bring me furs that come up to here they would say here's my boat bring me enough furs to fill up my boat and it just wasn't a a fair way of trade um so that that document and and that uh, report just does a really good job at showing this is what the history looked like and when i say history i'm still i'm talking about like 40, 60 years ago. It's not that far, no, far that back. So. I have to apologize. What what trust commission is it? What's the first word? It's Kiritani Truth Commission. Q-I-K-I-Q-T-A-N-I. Thank you. It's, it's kind of like the Truth Commission, but it's a it's a much smaller Nunavut-specific yeah. document. Yes, and that history of uh, unfair trading is Canada-wide. Basically, they did teach us that in school, at least even back then, the whole business of as high as a rifle and a lot of cheating on rifle heights and a lot of cheating, just a lot of cheating, generally speaking, is not unique. And I and even you know, just that, it nicely illustrated how even if you were a full-time hunter-trapper, that, that might have not been sustainable for you and your family. So you would have had to go to those government yeah. handouts that they would have forced you into. Anyway. Yeah, you're kind of pinned anyways, which is... Mm-hmm just brutal. I was wondering, you know, so there's a situation in Canada's north where the center of power is down south and the needs of the northern communities are largely ignored or, or, you know, they're not very seriously dealt with. Is that a common pattern in other countries sort of worldwide? You know, think about Greenland, say, for instance, or I don't know, northern Russia. Yeah. So I think what we've seen uh, across the globe in different areas, there are different ways that governments or bodies of power have decided to assimilate Indigenous peoples. Uh, in the States, we saw that very forceful, very just straight up violence, you yeah. know, bringing back uh, Indian scalps and things like that. Um, and even I couldn't imagine being in a situation like that, because I think already here in Canada, we are, we as Inuit are talked about like such a mythical type creature, but Native Americans, oh my goodness, like that's an even like the way that their narrative is portrayed as if like they haven't even been around for centuries. Like I feel, I feel so bad for them. Um, But in saying that, that's where we see a lot of really awesome leaders come out of. We see a really, uh, a lot of, you know, really strong individuals that are, you know, in, in some ways I think we're forced to become these forces to not mess with but uh, that's fine too I think in Greenland after we saw uh, Denmark colonize them I don't think very many people talk about this my mom's Danish I am half white I understand that kind of world even though I haven't had I haven't looked it Um, so I I feel you know I talk about my level of privilege and that's definitely where it comes from it comes from my my white side um and looking at how Denmark has colonized Greenland and how that relation has changed and has begun to change so that Inuit are being given more power making decision in Greenland, being given a lot more leeway, if you will, to decide what is going to happen in yeah. Greenland and for Greenland. Uh, and Denmark seems to have kind of taken uh, almost a, their arm's length almost out um, in some ways. I can't speak to specifics, but I know that that relationship has definitely gotten better. And there's a lot of practices in Greenland that Canada should and can pull from. Uh, New Zealand is another really good one, too, in terms of their cultural revitalization for the Maori. uh, And that 
I don't know specific to that history, except it was really, really bad and really yeah. dark. And it seems to have been making a comeback. So I I hope well, we don't have to get to that place in Canada. But I think we might have to get worse before we move mm. in a better direction. Well, I hope not. I mean, I'm really encouraged to hear that there are promising models available at least. But uh, at the same token, I just heard you say we're still not even moving in the right direction yet. Is that fair to say? I think there's positive individual change. Mm. I don't think there's a level of systemic change that I think it needs to get really bad before it kind of tips on its head. You sort of wonder how much worse it can get, though. You asked everybody to uh, write an email to their MPs and everybody back last, I don't know, summer about housing. So I did. You know, I wrote to all those Northern ministers and my MP and sent it off and didn't exactly forget about it, but it's not like I was checking the mail every day to see my response from the minister responsible. They finally sent one three and a half months later. And I don't know how many people sent in letters, but I'm sure we all got the same one. And I was telling the guys that it said they were very pleased. Like he was all chuffed. We've approved this amount of money and that amount of money. And I do recall you nailing somebody down in parliament about you approved. I think the number was 40, $42 million in funding. And we've so far received three, where's the rest of it. We need the money to actually operate. And as I recall, you got no answer for weeks and weeks. So this letter comes three and a half months later, and it talks about the amount of money they've allocated for this or that immediate question. Okay. So you've allocated, how much have you actually released to spend? And then it went on to sort of, in a, in a very satisfied tone, announced that they'd built 81 new housing units in Nunavut in 2020, 74 in Iqaluit and I think seven in Arviat or something like that. And the need was for 3,000 units. And my thought was, no, they're not really trying very hard. And then furthermore, in 2021, it's going to be shorter yet because of COVID. The houses that they built this year will be falling apart by the time the first 3,000 are built at this rate. And that's the frustrating part. The federal government doesn't deal with the repercussions of what they don't provide. The lack of quality of life and the lack of basic human rights that we see in the territory, they don't deal with the family stress or the turmoil that happens in communities. They don't deal with the RCMP shootings. They don't deal with foster kids being forced into the foster care system because their home is deemed unfit because it's so riddled with mold and their parents can't get help from anyone because the federal government so severely underfunds Nunavut Housing Corporation that it can't it can barely even keep up with what's there and that's not even workable to an extent so I think also just this kind of standard of what's okay for a group of brown people to go through versus what's okay for a group of white people to go through and what are those standards and what does that look like? And I think even that is something that's taught and that's, you know, when (sighs) we're asking about, you know, specific things of what people expect, like how they interact when they come to the territory, it's almost like being taught Maybe this isn't a fair statement to say blanket, but I don't think enough Inuit and Northerners are taught their basic rights. And they don't know when to say no and yes, and this is okay, and this isn't. And then when it's not, how do you escalate to the necessary individuals? And then a lot of this becomes life and death situations and really, really uh, things that would not fly in any way, shape, or form here and happen all the time in the North. And it's just all the systems work nicely together in one big beast to make it hard to break out of. And when you find those few people like me that do, um, it's kind of, I don't know, I feel like we kind of had this touch and go. And I just mean we in society in general, like we'll have this conversation, us four sitting here, but then what? So that's why I really like these conversations because people need to start thinking about it. And my whole thing, my whole life has been, if I'm fortunate enough to not be worried about X, Y, and Z, let me help people that are. So I hope people start to turn the conversation into, oh, I'm not worried about 
this. Like I made a note earlier of those norms. Your norm in your life is uh, I'm going to graduate. I'm going to go to post-secondary. I'm going to find a husband or a wife. I'm going to have kids. I'm going to have the nice white picket facts. I'm going to retire. I'm going to get my pension. I'm going to, you know what mine is? Mine is getting alive, staying alive until I'm 25. Mine is trying to not bury as many friends by the time I graduated high school. That's my norm. And that is our norms. So even those like extreme differences of uh, what what is quality of life and how do we make sure everyone has access to it? Mm. I think it's that's where we need to push the conversation to. Yeah. You know, until a government is threatened by voters, they're not going to change their behavior. And as long as enough people in Canada don't even have an opinion about what's going on because they have no information about it, they're not going to cast any votes that affect any of that. And I'm pretty sure, sadly, my other role in this group is I'm the worst cynic of the three of us. And I'm sadly pretty convinced that politicians in all the major parties, certainly the two big ones, are very aware that they don't need to worry politically. It hasn't cost them politically anything. And I look at Jagmeet Singh, and I hope he's the guy that changes that. I hope he's the guy that makes it really threatening to just continue to pay lip service. I mean, the joke I make with some friends is, (laughs) some carefully chosen friends, (laughs) is, well, you know, take your pick. You can pick Mr. Trudeau, who says the words but does no actions. He certainly says the nice words. But then nothing comes of it or very little, like that letter. Or you could go with the conservatives who don't even bother to say the nice words. I mean, they're not even pretending to care. No. And or you could look at the NDP who, you know, do they have a prayer? Well, I don't know. But the stuff you just said. So we're old guys. We've seen friends die. And we've seen suicides in our communities. But nothing like what you're talking about. I I have to believe if I have a shred of optimism less, it is that ignorance is the main reason for all this stuff persisting. I don't know. I like to think so too, but I've also had a number of people look at me point blank in the bus and have a number of options. And clearly we're going to sit in my area and choose not to yeah, because of I'm, how I look. So yeah, I think I, I just... it's important to give people the benefit of the doubt, but I also think it's okay to assume that you might be doing some educating. Um, I think to hmm. um we really need to start the conversation of allyship and that's something that you know t- talking to like jagmi there's no way no way i would run for a party if i did not believe in my leader yeah hmm. i could not back up somebody i didn't believe in hmm. um i try not to preach about jagmi too much because he is exactly like you see him i am he's and i i don't think Yes, I I 100% back up my leader and I will answer any questions I have about I have the utmost respect for him and I trust in him that he would do the right thing. And even if it needed to be through a tough conversation, I have never shied away from giving Jagmeet my honest opinion. And I don't, I doubt I could do that anywhere else and be able to stay comfortably hmm. in my spot. I feel very safe and that's, very comfortable that's to very be able to report. just say, this is what it is. And this is what I see. Um, and Jugmeet has never hmm. shied away from me being, that, being that's exactly how you see us in public is what is going on. Uh, very collaborative. Uh, I find cultures are very similar too. Um, so we just kind of have an unspoken already almost connection and I, I i think in this day and age we all think everybody needs to have all the answers right away you need to be able to tell me this and that and the other thing and that's why jugme has a team and that's why he has us as his colleagues and that's a huge one too is that yes he is my party leader but he is always my colleague and that's always that's the dynamic that we work in and ndp we all work together um he is our party leader, yes, but for the most part, we're all having these discussions and it's not, a, how do I say it? Like, it's not the way you see the liberals and conservatives. Like, that's why I could never run and I never believed in those parties because I knew I would never have an actual They're voice like- and influence and per- yeah. like almost purpose there at the table. Um, I have 
every piece of confidence in my leader. Nice. And I don't say that lightly. <laughs> like, no. I, I don't preach hard about people I don't believe in. So Jeff That's Mead a, is just a, a ring of endorsement. I mean, thanks for sharing that. One of the things that got me interested in paying attention to you is the sense that you are not a typical politician. And I had the same sense about a local MLA here that we interviewed last fall, Bowen Ma, also NDP as it turns out, but very interested in service to the community. We asked her why she's in it. She said, well, because I got something to give to the community. And her behavior reflects that. It's great to see how the NDP has come along in the last election like that was a big surprise because we had, we didn't see Jagmeet Singh much until the election started to happen. And then I think the press decided, oh, we'll give this guy some coverage. And holy smokes, he came out as, as really strong. And the policies are getting better known. And even if the NDP uh, number of MPs raises up another five or 10 in the next election, that's huge because there's more and more power there in terms of getting policy taken care of. I mean, I'd love to see the NDP win the next election, but they don't need to in order to have more and more impact. So I think, I think it's a good trend we're seeing. I would lo- just encourage people to look at how things roll out. You know, I sit here every day and I talk about being a member of parliament and how important politics is and voting and it interacts with your whole life and da 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 da. But this is my like this is my life and what I do every day. Your average Canadian isn't necessarily thinking about the things that are happening at the level at on a national level that are going to affect them. Um, so I think it's hard harder outside of an election to have conversations about the importance of what they're doing. But what we will start to see and what we already do see is the conservatives pouring in a bunch of money for advertising against Trudeau. What we'll start to see is Trudeau's government spending a lot of money, spending a lot of time at making a bunch of announcements that are never going to get fulfilled. Instead, what we could be seeing like NDP wants is people getting vaccines roll out in a timely manner. We don't want to see an election. People need help right now. We want to get mm-hmm. people the help right now, but we we'll, won't. And we'll only be saying that until an election starts because then all the liberals and conservatives are going to do is he said, she said they did it. Not me. Their fault, not mine. And that's all they're going to do. The, and that's the other thing about NDP. When you really look at my work, Jagmeet, Matthew Green, Nikki Ashton, all of my colleagues, we are really people, politicians. We really do a lot more to connect to community, to connect to the people that we represent, to make sure that we're telling our messages clearly and we're not working from our own agenda. Like even just looking at me, I don't walk around preaching pharmacare and Medicare, not because I don't agree with that, but because that's not what my constituents are asking for. Mm. And because NDP gives me the room to be able to advocate for what my constituents need. So I think that that's something that's really important as well. I have never pushed an NDP agenda and you can see that. I you know, and not to say like I, pharmacare is great, Medicare is great. It's all great, but it's not what Nuna would need, and it's not what I need to be talking about. So even about just that, how and how we're we're talking about things, and especially leading up to elections, I uh, think it's something key. So, okay, you just mentioned you're an MP every day. What's the craziest? I never thought I'd be this person thing that you've experienced as an MP. Ever since being elected, I've been really bad at, I'm not good at stopping and kind of taking a moment to say, wow, (laughs) like I got, Uh I didn't, I wasn't election. It was like, okay, what are we doing next? And it wasn't like, I, I worked like a nut job. I worked 12, 13, 14 hours. I worked last Christmas. I barely took weekends off. I worked till 11 o'clock all the time. It was just so nutty in that and in all that time I never really learned how to stop and say wow like there are things happening and I need to stop and appreciate them and really because people wanted to know how I felt about being elected and I still don't have an answer about (laughs) like excited or I can't tell you what I thought just 
my brain is always, what's the next thing that I'm going to be working on? So I've tried very hard to take more time to stop and look around and say, wow, the, this is this is big uh, and this is good and this is a good goal to reach. So in the beginning, I was constantly kind of like looking for the feeling of being an MP because that's what people wanted to know from me. And I think it was so Elections Canada messed up my paperwork and I wasn't actually sworn in the same time as all of my colleagues. I actually wrote like on a little sticky note in the book. I didn't actually like sign my thing. So that didn't actually happen, I think, for two more weeks. I'd have to find the exact date. So I wasn't actually MP when everybody else in NDP was. So I had gotten a chance, I guess, to have a more private thing. So Jugmeet came. Peter Julian uh, as house leader for NDP and Jody Wilton Raybold just happened to be available. We were in caucus and I said, Jugmeet, can you come across the road for 10 minutes? We're going to go get me sworn in and we'll come right back to the meeting. He said, yep, cool. And that's, it was very small, real quick. Um, I ended up going to Jody's swearing in after and because she came to mind, that led me to hers. And that was like sitting in, I don't know how she's going to feel about me saying this, but almost like indigenous royalty. (laughs) Like I was sitting in a room of royalty and just these beautiful like-minded people that shared similar views and histories and ideations. And we didn't have to say it because you could just see it in all the beadwork and the regalia. And I was, it was really powerful to be in that, really horrible institution that was supposed to have killed us all off. And all of a sudden we were all sitting in there together in this really powerful moment. So I think that one was one of my wow moments. Yeah, that's Uh, a good one, actually. Wow. That's, that's a way more of an answer. I thought you were just going to tell me, you know, free food in the cafeteria. (laughs) What's the the best thing that's happened? I've seen a couple of clips where there was uh, a young girl, she was selling some product for charitable reasons and uh, you were speaking to her and she just looked, you both looked super pleased. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Cook them crunchies. That's exactly it. And I just thought, what is the most fun thing that you've gotten to do since becoming an MPS as a result of being where you are now? What's the most fun thing? Only very recently, I have put in more effort and realized that I don't need to necessarily work with older people all the time. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> I know. That's why I said it like that. So in the last few weeks, I've just been really trying to, because that's, that's a thing of being a member and being on the Hill. It, it's, it's pretty easy to be honest, to get wrapped up in this, you know, there's a couple thousand of us that live this life every day of, you know, constant politic, politic, MP, MP, parliament, parliament, all those discussions constant. It can be really easy to get disconnected quickly from community Mm. because people aren't interacting with that day in day out like you are so I find it more so that it's it's harder to find and explore new ideas with people that have set lifestyles and set things already in their life so I think it's one of my favorites is finding not even like-minded people just people willing to and able to have an open conversation about whatever it may be. But I also realized that that comes from even, you know, being able to think about what on earth is going on in this messy procedural policy, oppressive systemic place, uh, even that and coming out of that and realizing the issues in that is a significant amount of privilege, I think, that I held, uh, being fortunate enough to not worry about my quality of life which in turn allowed me to be able to explore and educate myself in a way that makes sense for me, not through an institution that I never felt I fit into anyways. So I I think that in that sense, that that is something that's so important. And it's something so, so important to stay connected to community, because once you lose sight of that, it's it's hard to continue to do a job in a way that makes sense. And I'm I'm a good person. I'm good at interviews, meetings, facilitating. I can do all this stuff, the public speaking. But to me, the important part is that community and reaching to community. And that was my first conversation uh, after I was asked if I'd be interested in running was 
I'm not letting politics ruin the foundation of who I am. And I'm not letting it blindside me from my purpose in life. And my purpose in life is to help other people that aren't fortunate to have the means to be able to do it themselves. And I know that. And I took that on uh, years ago. I took that on a long time ago. And that's something that's hard to come by because it's easy to get wrapped up in the game and it's easy to fall into the trap of the 15, 20 second sound bits of the suit and ties of the handshaking and those BS emails that you talk about. It's really easy to get lost in it. But as long as I can stay connected with people and community, there's no way I'd ever lose it. So I I think that in a lot of ways that that's where a lot of people get lost. And that's why I'm so good at my job because I don't, that's my priority. That's what's most huh. important. Yeah. That's about all I have. The only other question I had is, does everybody, everybody, <laughs> this is sort of a joke. Every time I see anything on social media, they just refer to you as Mumalak. I don't ever see Ms. Kakak. I don't ever see, it's just Mumalak. Is, is that really everybody that you deal with at home? Know you on yeah, a first name uh, basis? Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, don't call me MP. <laughs> don't call me Miss. No, 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 no. If we're on Homelands, I am Mumilok here. <laughs> but if I'm in the House of Commons, no, I'm MP. Excuse me? Who yeah. are you talking to? Um, my constituents, though, no, I'm 100% Mumilok, yeah, that... and that's that's it. Um, I can't. The titles, eek, no. <laughs> Fun. Fun. I just wondered about that. That's the way it seems when you see the interactions on social media. And I just wondered, and that's a pretty forceful and answer. That is, to an extent, my doing, um, but that is also, that's just how I think goes. in some cases, a lack of uh, respect and some sexism, ageism. I run into that all the time everywhere. Uh, it doesn't surprise me, but I also, that's my thing in politics can look feel and be different you know call me by my first name let's scrap the title because i'm not here to uh, be above or below there is no hierarchy when i'm talking with my constituents now it's important though on the flip side when you're having federal institution mp to mp or mp to minister conversation that's different because hierarchy is important on that side yeah forms of address indicate status there Totally. So it all depends on the place and time, but more to your comment, I think it's sometimes a lack of respect from the media and I hound them all the time. And that's just one area I never, I never cared to waste my time on. The age thing, I made a big deal out of that. I saw one, I think it was a tweet where you talked about media for crying out loud. It's not quote depression, quote, it's not quote stress, unquote, you know, it's just depression. And I thought, yeah, the quotes make it a question mark. And you sort of think, are you just making that a question mark because it's me? Would you put quotes around that if Justin Trudeau had to take time off? You know, I thought that was pretty, it hadn't even occurred to me until you pointed it out. It hadn't occurred to me that that could be received that way. And it just sort of makes you wonder how much of that goes right by without even noticing, you know? Well, even the way media talks about Indigenous peoples, like uh, to look at... um any of the trials, any of the major trials that we've seen lately, Tina oh, Fontaine, boy. Colton Bushy, do you know the names of their killers? <sighs> no. I think I'll lodge it. And that's, that's yeah. the issue that was not Colton's trial. It was not Tina's trial. Yeah. It was Gerald Stanley's trial. It wasn't the victims. Yeah. And that's just a small example. I really notice too when people or when media decides to use names instead of like an indigenous person Mm. or a you know i i find that really interesting as well because it often i find depends on what the circumstances were for example if it's something to do in a like a hospital or in some kind of institution where someone is clearly at fault Mm -hmm. they will often word it differently than if you can point it to the victim or you can make it appear that way. So I think even in, in media and how we view and think about, but more so what we find acceptable. Yeah. No, I even in those concepts, like look at uh, Trudeau and his track record with his indigenous and non-indigenous MPs. It's not good. You know, he kicked out Hunter when he was having a bunch of issues 
not to back hunt or anything like that, but look at what happened with O'Regan, who went away for treatment as well, who is now a minister. Mm. So what kinds of standards do we have and allow and accept and how we portray them, how we talk about them, how we move forward with them. That's all really, really important to me. Yeah. It's, and it, again and again, you do see if some white guy does some awful thing, the subheadline usually says he's a well-liked baker in a small town. Whereas if some non-white guy does some awful thing, they're never painted as having human attributes. They just did the horrible thing and that's it. It's really, once somebody points it out, it's a little hard to unsee because it just goes on and on and on. But we allow it in all corners of society too. Look at Ma- indigenous peoples being used as mascots look at yeah, oh, yeah. being used look at you know there's all these different kinds of examples of what we allow look at disney often the villains are dark skinned or a like an actual color uh often we're teaching our kids right from the get-go you know i think yeah. of jafar in aladdin i yeah, think yeah. Of, you think of any villain in those they're often you know ursula is gray like a just a darker shade <laughs> right from the beginning we implant this idea of what is acceptable and what isn't and even in those we don't talk about those clear dynamics and boundaries to say and 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 in that too we realize and we find it more and more normalized that not seeing ourselves represented in all areas of life is okay too yeah so it just plays back into this a white society is a society that we should be investing into because that's the right way of living. Yeah. And I say that very broadly. We've used a whole bunch of your time. Really appreciate it. I wonder, do you have anything you want to ask us? Anything, any, any last messages you want to send? Um, I hope that we can start having different conversations around what we view as normal because what has been clearly shown in this pandemic is that we don't and for too long haven't been helping individuals that need it and our normal shouldn't be the amount of people that have been struggling because they have lost a job or like could you I couldn't imagine being a small business you are forced to close your doors because of this COVID and having to look at big corporations like mm. Amazon, just totally making like record profits at the time. I couldn't imagine. And that's not a world that we should have to live in. That's, yeah. That doesn't make sense. We should be in a world where Amazon and big corporations like that pay their fair share so that individuals on the ground can continue to get support and keep their stores open. Yeah. Uh, we look at cashiers, post office workers. Why are these people putting their health on the line every day and not seeing livable wages and access to benefits like they should? Uh, we're seeing post-secondary, those opportunities, uh, talking to my writing specifically, people are missing out because they aren't or can't be going to post-secondary because of COVID right now. They don't have the connectivity ability and are missing out on internships, on on life. They have to pause their life right now and uh, like postpone post-secondary, postpone everything else. And that's just completely, completely unacceptable. So I think we need to start talking about a normal that makes sense where Even in a pandemic like this, we wouldn't be seeing the devastating numbers Mm. for individuals struggling so much. There is no reason people should be worried about their parents in any healthcare facility because we should have national standards that hold people accountable so that people continue to be able to get that care that they need towards the end of life. There are so, so many things that we need to talk about differently and we need to recreate this normal and there's power in people there is 100 percent things that we can do to make those things change we've seen it in black lives matter protests we have seen the power in people covid has shown us these things as much as it's been a struggle there are definitely areas where we can recreate 
this idea of normal and we don't need to be playing by the big corporate and the big the big bucks the people with the deep pockets we don't need to be playing by their rules they need yeah. to be paying their fair share so i hope we can start talking about a new normal these are good things to think about so thank you for that I think it's just great that you've taken the time to be with us. I know you have a lot of yeah. stuff to do. You go to a lot of meetings, you're on a lot of shows and ours is a pretty small one, but I sure am glad that you've joined us. I think our listeners will really enjoy this too. I, I think so. And if you are listening to this and you have any thoughts, start looking into it because help is needed. Work is needed. It matters. And we do have space. We do have capacity. We can do stuff. So that's, that's what I would say. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. We'll let you go, I guess, now. Anybody else? Anybody got it? anything at all? Oh, I met Peter Julian once, so. <laughs> Peter Julian, like, I definitely, you know, all, we're all people. All my colleagues have their thing. And Peter Julian is, like, definition of heart of gold. I can't explain that. He's huh. He is such a comforting, calm I just, I can't, there are certain people of my party. I, I super can preach about all day. Uh, Peter, Julian, Jugmeet Singh, Rachel Blaney, Matthew Green. I could talk about them all day. Jenny Kwan. Oh my goodness. Some of my colleagues are, are really, really awesome. But uh, Peter, Julian, I can't think of very many people I would say that about. And uh, that man legitimately, I think, has a heart of gold. That's interesting because I met him at Howard's wedding. So Howard is a guy that Rich knows. Howard is a heart of gold guy, 100%. And so it would make sense that he's friends with him. I didn't know who he was. I shook hands and chatted for a while. And somebody told me afterwards that he was and a And that's how Peter guy. is. Like, he, yeah. he, wouldn't, he wouldn't ever tell you. That's no, just how he... somebody else told me. <laughs> yeah, he's just... Yeah, I definitely have some really awesome colleagues. I think in allyship, the one of probably the biggest thing is you are supporting a movement without taking it over. And that's yeah. the key part, the taking over part. We don't yeah. need saving. We don't need your whatever you think we need. We just need the support and the backup in the messaging in that. But wait, we're old men. We we have to mansplain <laughs> like at least 20 minutes every Tell day. Tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get enough of it in my job, apparently. <laughs> like, so let's yeah, spend our that's... Monday evening. <laughs> <laughs> nice answer there. Nice answer. <laughs> Okay, let's wrap up. Thanks very much again. It was sure great hearing from you and yeah, learned a lot today. Have a long way to go, but it sure has been good. Awesome. You take Thank care you of all. yourself and we'll talk again soon, we hope. You too. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mumla. Bye. 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 That was pretty interesting. Boy, she had a lot I to say. am so impressed by her. Man, she stayed an hour at seven o'clock. It's 7.30 her time, eh? Mm -hmm. Hour and a half. Yeah, that's very this is awesome. just, just part of her 14-hour day. We don't talk to MPs often on this <laughs> program. Nice. Listeners, PJ has found himself interested in uh, affairs of the North. It's fascinating. It's just, I, I just didn't know. None of it is gigantic. That's one thing I didn't really realize. It's yeah, just 20% 20, 20 of Canada's land mass, but maybe more like a third when you count all the, uh, the various channels and straits and whatnot around Baffin Island and that kind of thing. Yeah, the area so, within boundary is just gigantic. 40,000 people. Looking at photos of Iqaluit is just a fascinatingly, just a beautiful place. Makes me want to go there. I've seen lots and lots of pictures, of course, in social media. PJ, thanks for uh, thanks for organizing this one. Is Oh, you're welcome. Really interesting. Of course, I got to watch her next four or five interviews and see if she says, you know, I was talking to three old white guys. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I just they couldn't were, believe it. They're so ignorant. It was unbelievable. I don't think so. I actually, geez, I liked listening to her. I mean, I always like learning and stuff, but I, I have a think... feeling like I'm starting to know the place, even though obviously mm. I'm not. And it's like wandering around on street view for about 15 minutes does not <laughs> teach you much. But it's a lot better than not wandering at all. Yeah. You know? And I mean, it must be incredibly expensive to fly up to a Calouette. But I would is. I ever love to be up there for a week in the summer just to see it? Like, and yeah, I know it's, it, just, it's just a tiny part of the North as well, but. Okay, Jay, you've seen the midnight sun, right? The land of the midnight sun. You've been there. 
Sí. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see the Northern Lights. I'd like to go to Iqaluit right now for about a day. Right. Yeah. There's a little bit of sun each day around noon, right? Right. Yeah. Now. Sun dogs, stuff like that. And you got to fly out. I don't know who pays for everything. If you get post-secondary education, who pays for all the flying? That's right. Yeah. When you look at St. Pierre, which is a French territory, and France pays for the airfare for yeah. those guys and the education. As long as you qualify, you get it all paid for. You end up in some place like Bordeaux and, and get your training and then and then head back. And the truth is we we as a country did a huge amount of damage up there. And I guess there's no going back to, okay, can you all just be nomads again then? So there's no going back to that. So we as a, a nation have a responsibility to, to fund. And the funding is too small right now. But you can't just throw money at it either. Because if you throw money at it, then you're getting people who don't know how to live in a modern house or you know, like she said, they're still going to keep plugging up those holes. And I thought that was a really surprising thing to say is that part of the problem is people don't actually know how to live in those houses. Oh, wow. That's a thing. Yeah. So how do you get people trained? How do you get them to want to be trained and how do you make the training available to this? It sounds like there's a lot that can be done besides just, Oh, by the way, you're going to need to throw another couple $300 million per yeah. year into housing alone. And what's that per Canadian? It's actually not that bad. Uh, There's 40,000 people up there. That's one one thousandth of the population of Canada. So do politicians spend one one thousandth of the, their time thinking about Nunavut? Probably more. Yeah. So if you look at it per capita basis, politicians are probably doing just fine. But when you look at it, what... How much damage was done as a society when we killed their killed their dogs? Yeah, it took like, their kids it, away, oh. intro- let disease run rampant. Like, so just, there's a huge debt up there. It's not a per capita thing. You know, we've got to take care of the problems from a funding point of view. And then people like Mumalak, if there's if there's enough of them, if there was a little a small army of Mumalaks, they could actually take care of the cultural end of things. Like, okay, I know what needs to happen in terms of training, in terms of this, in terms of that. Let's do something about it. Yeah, I the whole thing. I Let's do more about it, I should say. The other thing, too, that was interesting, she said she decided years ago, like she was a hockey coach. She was involved in community stuff. Hockey's the only one I can remember, but it was other stuff like the community center programming, that kind of stuff. She just wanted to help. And I bet you that's how they, like, I kind of wonder, somebody looked at her and said, hmm, this person could really go a long ways to upending the status quo for politics in this part of the world. Cause the prior person was just like she said, if she was part of the liberal, she was invisible just like that prior person. Hmm. Oh my God. Walking the streets of Nook Greenland. I did wonder about that. And that is a question like why would the streets in Nook Greenland and the general city look so much better than. Yeah. Well, it could be. The population, the de- demographics are quite different in terms of how many foreigners are there. Like a lot of people from Denmark are there. So kind of Denmark kind of bringing a lot of their sensibilities in and money. And then your other thing that you mentioned, which we don't know, but I bet, I bet the Danes pour way more money into Greenland than Canada does into Nunavut per capita. But it's kind of funny. Like I, if I ask her, hey, have you ever been to Nuke, however you pronounce it? It's kind of like asking me if I've ever been to the Yukon, you know, because I live in Canada, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, It's just it's, like, a, it's a long distance and a big flight, probably a connecting flight. Is she in Ottawa? Is she coming to us from Ottawa? Don't know. Oh, we don't know. Sue's got a message for us, guys. Lay it on us, She's Sue. reminded me of, I keep forgetting. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. Is it our second anniversary? It is, I guess. It is. Second anniversary. It is. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Sue. Thanks, Sue. Nice. They say thanks, Sue. So there you have it. Thanks again to Mumalak Kakak, the MP for Nunavut, for joining us. So generous with their time. I really do hope that you have made it through this whole thing and that you do have food for thought and that it has been a positive experience for you as a listener. Certainly has been for us, I believe. There was a lot of information there. I wonder if some of it will be news to our listening group. 
I expect it will be. And I encourage everyone, if you have any slight spark of interest at all, just start Googling. There is an ocean of information about Nunavut, about the Indigenous experience in Canada, particularly in Northern Canada, about the government's behaviors over the last couple of years. There's, it's just endless. So give it a thought. Have a look. It's probably going to be interesting for you. Mm-hmm.